Well, thank you guys so much for sticking around. I'm, I'm really delighted to have a chance to chat with all of you about talent. And it's a theme that's come up several times today in, in some of the panels. And in fact, Maria Gabriel mentioned it several times in her speech. So I thought before we go into some of the, the topics, I'd be curious to hear from, from you all what you made of that. Um, do you see it as a shift at all in terms of uh, the EU perspective and, and developing the tech ecosystem in Europe? So um, I'm not a politician, so I don't want <laughs> to comment too much on political shifts. But I think, um, you know, from a from a point of view of the tech companies, we've definitely seen a dramatic shift. Uh, I run a tech company called Get Your Guide out of Berlin. Uh, when we started um, in Berlin in 2012, uh, there were no tech companies, and uh, we were one of the few games in town. Today, you have between uh, Get Your Guide and 26, Delivery <coughs> Hero, Flixbus. I mean, like you have five to 10 uh, companies that are valued at multiple billions of euros. We have tens of thousands empl of employees <coughs> among us. And the, the one resource we crave the most is actually no longer capital, what it was when we started, but it's actually talent. And in that perspective, I think there's a complete new dimension to the debate that hasn't been really considered before. Nico, any thoughts? Uh, Look, I would say yes, but. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of like, you know, is Europe on the right path and, and what we've heard before? So, uh, not paraphrasing all of that, but I came back to Europe back in 2007. Uh, if you look at the venture capital industry and the tech industry back then, it was really small. So, to put some numbers on that, in 2009, I think it was about like 4 billion euro actually flowing in you know, European venture capital. Today, it's 20 billion. So, that's great, but. Actually, if you look at the entire venture capital industry, it has grown everywhere very, very fast. So to put that in perspective, 2018, 20 billion euro flowing into European venture capital, 130 billion uh, into US venture capital, 70 billion into Chinese venture capital. Last year, the growth of venture capital investment in Europe, 4%. Growth of venture capital in the US and China, 50%. So actually, I, I think we need to realize that in a, in a broader context mm -hmm. that the tide is going up very, very fast. You know, it's a massive transformation. So sure, Europe is playing, but today we're playing with a sixth of the capital of, uh, of uh, the US and a third, more or less, of the capital of China. Mm. So we, ne we need to catch up to do on, um, on capital. I think you know, we should also talk about talent because at some point, I don't think we are, I mean, we could attract more capital if we had more talent and bigger companies to, to fund, essentially. And Andreas, I mean, do you have any thoughts in terms of what uh, EU legislators and legislators elsewhere in Europe have done in terms of uh, fostering the tech ecosystem here? I mean, what has worked in your view and what didn't work so far? I mean, the letter that these uh, um, small and medium-sized companies have made out of the tech sector is a very uh, strong message. But let's be honest, I mean, we are lacking talent not only in the tech sector, we are in the meanwhile in Europe, especially in Germany, uh, lacking people in all sectors. So mm. we have to be careful not to overstate one sector, but it's true and it has been mentioned very clearly also by you, no? Mm -hmm. uh, Europe uh, needs in the tech sector, which is a very fast growing sector, probably more talent than in sectors where we are strong already, in the where we have been strong in the past. So the challenge is both, I think we need also investment, better uh, uh, facilities for investment, because even if we are growing, yes, and you were su the, the successful companies can say, now we don't have a problem anymore with investment, but those who are about to start, they will have still the same problem. And as worldwide, it's that big, we need more in Europe. And I think for this, we need a common European plan, especially from the member states, what we can really to do to make investment in Europe more mm. interesting. There is still a lot of divergency between the national uh, laws on tax. So Johannes, you mentioned earlier that one of the things that you crave most as a, as a startup is talent. Um, what are some of the biggest problems in terms of uh, getting that talent? I think Andreas mentioned uh, this letter from the Not Optional Initiative. Um, so if you could tell us a bit about what problems you're seeing there, uh, that, would be, that would be helpful. Yeah, just to specify with Andreas, I totally agree. So, like, more capital would be absolutely better, and I'm the first one to sign up to, you know, what you said that uh, ultimately there's still a big gap. Uh, but capital is actually relatively mobile, and we do see a lot of uh, U.S. and Chinese capital now flowing into Germany. So, 
there are funding sources for the good companies, and it's a lot more than it used to be eight years ago. Could still be better, but you know, it's coming. Uh, however, the, the bigger uh, topic that I see with Get Your Gut, also all of the companies where I'm involved in or invested in, is that in Germany in particular, we don't have a stock option incentive program like in Silicon Valley. And uh, most politicians and, and also general public just doesn't know that because it never existed with you know, BMW or Audi or Volkswagen or traditional companies where you would you know, maybe join at like age 18 or 20 as an intern and then gradually work up the ranks. But today, people don't work for cash salaries anymore. When I have a negotiation uh, on salary with anyone who is director level and, and above, uh, at, at Get Your Guide, they only talk about stock options. They only talk about ownership in the company because ultimately they also see, I join Get Your Guide and you know it's a great company, it's growing very fast and everyone is investing in the company. But instead of you know just maybe optimizing my cash salary over the next 10 years, I rather want to optimize my ownership in the company because that is the much bigger lever uh, that I have. And the problem in Germany that I face today is that I cannot offer that. It's simply something that, from a legislation point of view, doesn't work in Germany. Mm. And that is really different to the US, where um, you know stock option schemes are completely normal. This is how Silicon Valley is powered. If you want to join a startup, you would obviously get ownership and could get stock options or straight stock. And you would be treated the same as any investor in the company if you would work as a company and if you would invest your time. I think that's a massive problem that you know all of the German companies now try to work around with cash bonus systems, but at the end of the day, a cash bonus system is not uh, stock options, and that that's a problem. And so, what exactly <coughs> is the problem that's preventing you from from offering these these options in the way that you would like? And and has it prevented you or Nicola from hiring people that you really wanted to and and weren't able to? Yeah. So maybe to 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 jump on that. I, I, I I think if we take a step back in terms of talent gap in Europe, I think you have two uh, for tech. Uh, you have one that we always talk about and that's true everywhere, engineers, right? So we lack engineers, data scientists, software developers, but that's also true in Silicon Valley, that's true everywhere. So it's just a fundamental shift that we don't train enough of those, and I think it's gonna change over time. And in that respect, on you know, in terms of training them, Europe is not that bad, actually. If we kept them, actually we're not that bad at training engineers. Um, the other gap we have, and mostly for companies like ours, essentially, where you get to a certain stage, um, it's actually hiring executives that have worked for tech companies before of a certain scale. And in Silicon Valley, you have, in specifically Silicon Valley, you have like generations of company that rehire some execs and so on and so on, and you have like lots of pattern recognition uh, built there that I think we lack in Europe. Uh, and to link that to stock options and, uh, and recruitment, uh, there are lots of Europeans actually in Silicon Valley that would come back, um, but they used to American style or U US style packages where you own a big share of the company or you have stock options, so meaning like you have a, a share of the pie and you share the upside of the company and that's what they want. So they don't want like a, a big paycheck, they might also want a big paycheck, um, but they want stock options. And it's true that today, if you look at the European landscape, and I agree that Germany, we have employees in Germany, Germany is a nightmare for that, um, you cannot give stock options because it's not structured this way. So essentially, like we had cases literally of um, employees to which we gave stock options that when they left the company, they decided to exercise the stock options, so to buy the shares, and technically the next day they're bankrupt because yeah. they need to pay a tax and they cannot sell the shares because the share is not liquid. That's how absurd it can be, right? So, so we had employees on the brink of bankruptcy when, because they're sitting on a million euro. That's hmm. how bad it is. Um, so yes, it needs to be fixed, and the issue is it's not like a, a single country issue because most of our companies end up hiring today all over Europe. I mean, we have an office in Berlin, we have uh, Madrid, Milan, we have some outside of Europe. Uh, so you would need like a European scheme to, to be competitive. Hmm. So, so today, it, it, is, it is an issue. I would not say for all employees, maybe not all employees care about, uh, about stock options, but at a certain level of, of skill and, and for executive, it is a big gap, actually, as a, as a hiring weapon. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe so, like um, to make it more concrete. So, you know, what what exactly is broken? So, number one is it's not harmonized across Europe. So, Nicolas and I, we both have, uh, you know, so you guys have a few offices across Europe. We have eight different offices in uh, eight different countries in Europe. It's a different regime in every single country. And obviously, our employees don't see themselves as oh, okay. I work in Spain or I work in France, so I should have a different uh, remuneration. 
regime when it comes to ownership in the company, they all want to have the same deal. And that's not possible, number one. So harmonization, I think, and that's also why we're here today, is really urgent in Europe. Uh, then number two is just avoiding, per se, dry income, what the issue that Nicolas just mentioned. It's impossible that any of our employees can pay the tax before they have ever redeemed their ownership with the company. But in Europe, how it still works, and particularly in Germany, is if you receive a benefit, then you're immediately taxed. And that is for a startup that basically has a fictional value, uh, it is a big problem. And then lastly, it's just the difference between uh, employment and, and, and capital. If I invest in Europe uh, as a capital investor, I pretty much have capital gains tax wherever I go. If I work for a startup as an employee, I never have capital gains tax, I always have a, a salary tax. And that's different in the UK, it's different in the US. And because we're no longer just uh, recruiting uh, European talent, we're recruiting a lot of people from Sil Silicon Valley or from London, uh, it's actually a big problem because ultimately they will compare their packages that they get there with our packages that we offer here. And Andreas, I mean, is, is this not also potentially risky in terms of, of a form of payment for employees? I mean. How, how realistic do you think this is in terms of having a European-wide scheme? I mean, the starting point should be that we have a look on that sector. And I mean, it's obvious that compared to other sectors, <coughs> maybe banking or others, you are you're, um, uh, opposed to a situation where your uh, skilled workforce comes from all over the world. Yeah. And if they look what they get elsewhere, they will rather uh, resist to go to European Union and rather stay outside. So it's a global challenge. Right. However, the debate in the European Union, those who are here from Brussels will know that we have been discussing that for at length in, in the last years. It's all the time that we take very much care about the worker at the situation when he starts his pension. And at that moment, it doesn't help him so much, and you have mentioned the example, <laughs> uh, if he cannot use it. But if, if the workforce is global, you cannot just say, because in Europe, for, for, for other companies, we want to protect them, and therefore they better stay outside the European Union. We have to f bring both debates together. But that's very difficult because the traditional pension systems, systems are like they are. They are very, uh, let's say, also in Germany, we would say, vermachtet with the people that are around, mm -hmm. uh, trade unions, and et cetera. So it's very difficult to change and to adapt it. But I think the point that you can make, and with that letter, you do that very clearly. At the first side, we are always saying, who wouldn't like to have tax benefits for his workers, everyone. So it's not that at the point, but the point that you can make is that your workforce is global, and if you don't get the, the similar advantages to those companies that you are in competition with, you have no chance to get these people. So we have to adapt that debate, but that's very difficult mm. because most people in the European Union, and you know that, are not seeing the global challenge. Most of them are still very happy with the situation we have in Europe. Um, and it's true that it's very cozy in the European Union. Uh, also, parts of the people that have worked in the Silicon Valley like to come back for that reason. But yeah. cozy alone will not make money. And uh, uh, the guy there who has been sitting here before, he just said, it's true. And uh, probably in that sector, it's even more true than in others. People want to make money in the end. And if that is not working as they can, it, it's a problem. Therefore, we have to discuss that. But maybe you should push a little bit more that debate. And always showing that the global challenge you have is also a talent. Yeah, and it's also, it's not just that the, the sector is more or less uh, driven by making money. It's also b because of competition of like big tech companies today. So forget Europe. If you're in Silicon Valley and you want to hire engineers, you cannot pay as much as Google or Facebook or Apple is paying. So essentially, you sell another story, which is an adventure. So obviously, you still pay well, but you sell an adventure that you're going to be the next Google or, or Facebook and so on and so on. And today, it's the same in Europe. I mean, Facebook is, I mean, we share um, the same building as Facebook. Facebook has like de data scientists actually just the floor above and blah, blah, car in Paris. <laughs> they pay them well. Yeah. Blah, car does have uh, stock options for some of its employees, right? Uh, we do, yeah. We, we do for all employees. So uh, what's tricky is it's um, uh, and, uh, an index and uh, uh, Vortec who's here, they've done like a great job actually describing that. Um, France is fairly lucky in that respect, so we have like a decent scheme, actually. Since mm. Macron, by the way. So yeah, mm. even pre-Macron, actually, it was decent. I mean, it was it, it got even better, actually, with Macron, but it, it was always like a small niche for um, uh, for like SMEs, essentially, that they that created, which was, you know, for once, actually, um, sensible. Uh, and, and it works pretty well, except, essentially, it only works for the French workforce. So whenever we hire people, and obviously, mm as a tech consumer company for Black Black Car, we did not want to be just a, a consumer play in France. So you, you have to expand outside of, um, of Europe. 
and we have that uh, the stock option issue I, I described was in the UK and Germany. So in the UK and Germany, so not to get too technical, but if you give stock options to someone very early on, so you're an early employee of BlaBlaCar, I give you stock options, the value of the of the company goes uh, goes up. When you leave the company, in some of these countries, actually the tax assumes that the value of the share today multiplied by the number of options you have is your net worth, and you should be taxed on that. Except the company is not yet sold or IPO or liquid, and you bankrupt overnight. Um, and that's the situation we have. If you want to give shares to uh, to German employee as a even as a German company, I think, but uh, as a non-German company, it's almost impossible. And so, what are you doing to to get around that? You pay more. You do, you do cash yeah. bonuses and so what, what what we do is basically we have a cash bonus pool that acts as if people would be your shareholders mm. <laughs> 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 well you laugh but this is actually I mean, it's like it's sad to say but this is how 98 percent of the german tech companies work mm -hmm. it's just like this is our workaround and um it's crazy in, in many respects because i'm um, like i don't want to get too technical here, but basically you start to have massive liabilities towards your own employees on your balance sheet um, over time, and that obviously creates a huge headache for all of the bankers before the IPO, because they don't want to see so much debt in the company, but that's all associated to the IPO, so you try to basically pay it off with the IPO, but then all of the investors don't want to pay cash bonuses to your employees, but rather want to... Uh, so without getting too much into the details, um, I think at the end of the day, the key problem is the politicians always tell us, build the next Google, build the next Facebook. And, you know, what we're saying is we would love to, you know, we don't sell the company. We sort of like want to carry it all the way. We want to build a global champion out of Germany. <coughs> but please create the laws so we can play on an even level playing field with Silicon Valley. And very clearly in Germany today, these laws don't exist. And I have uh, sort of like lobbied this with every single party, um, so with you know, in Germany with the Greens and with the uh, uh, Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats. Everyone says it's fantastic ideas. Employees should actually get better benefits and better stock options. The problem is it doesn't win you votes in the next election. Hence, uh, the problem sort of like you know uh, persists and it never gets fixed. And some countries like uh, France are lucky; they have a very progressive president who understands a little bit about the digital ecosystem and they have better uh, be better schemes. And then other European countries don't have that, including Germany. And I think that's a little bit the problem that we are in the European Union right now. Nicola and I we run pan-European <laughs> companies and we have 15. Uh, 18 different uh, tax regimes and different employee uh, compensation schemes, and it's just really, really difficult to deal with. And so you mentioned Germany was was tricky with that re uh, respect. Is there are there other countries that are particularly bad uh, in terms of Germany is bad, Spain is really bad, uh, Belgium is relatively bad, Holland is not that great, uh, Austria is bad, Italy is really <laughs> bad. <laughs> but you laugh, but I actually know all of them by now. <laughs> Uh, France is better. The UK is, is is much better. The Baltics are very good. And so, have you have you pushed this message with um, yes. either EU or you know local? Well, I'm national concerned mostly with Germany because this is where the uh, vast okay. majority of our workforce lives, and I'm not a full time politician, if you wonder, <laughs> but I run a company. But um, yes, yeah, so we've definitely pushed that issue. Not only us. If you look at uh, Index Ventures, the best uh, and uh, most performing uh, European venture capitalists, I can say that they are not a shareholder in my company. Um, a fantastic venture fund. They recently uh, pushed for change on this topic, and they solicited um, signatures for the uh, basically a petition for a uh, European stock option regime. And I think more than 700 CEOs actually signed, and I think all of the CEOs of the major uh, German tech companies. So given that we're in Brussels, the new commission portfolios will be announced tomorrow. There is a changeover. I mean, what um, you know, what are you hoping to get out of, of the next commission uh, with respect to this issue or even other issues? So I think three things, uh, frankly, that I see are really pressing in Europe if we want to build global digital uh, champions. I think number one, talent. Uh, so fixing, I think, the uh, stock option issue or like employee uh, ownership issue is number one. And I know it's probably unrealistic and I'm more of a startup mind than, uh, than, than a politician. Uh, but I would hope that in the next year or two, this issue is addressed and in the process of being fixed uh, on a pan-European level because I think it's just holding us back uh, immensely. I think second, uh, capital, for sure. If I look at my shareholder base, um, uh, if you look at the limited partners, so the investors in the venture funds that invested in Ghetto Guide, I don't see any 
European funds. It's mm. all Asian and, and American. So when Get Your Guide goes public, it might be a very big perceived uh, positive story uh, in Germany. But the reality is all of the proceeds will flow to non-German sources. Uh, so I think that's something that needs to get, get fixed. And then thirdly, I do see um, a midterm battle between the larger uh, American tech platforms and the European platforms. So as you grow to scale, you inevitably go into the sort of like standoff with the, the, the Googles and, and the Facebooks uh, of this world because uh, as you grow bigger, you land on their turf. I think uh, DLD was uh, uh, sponsored by Borda, so uh, any publishing house in Europe, I think, uh, knows that very well. And I think that is definitely going to be uh, a major topic for us. Probably not in the short term, but uh, definitely in the next five to 10 years. And do you have any thoughts, Andreas, in terms of what um, what the EU should be doing in terms of fostering the tech ecosystem going forward? I mean, I'm a very strong advocate of that idea of creating a level playing field. But the, the level playing field cannot be done in a way that we say, that's our impression of the economy. Here, the whole world should follow us. They will not do that. We, if we don't find a way where Europe also gets an adaptation of its own business and economic model to what the world does. Mm. And we may not like what the world does, but it's like that. We cannot, uh, the Chinese are doing what they do. And we, they will do what without our interference what they want. So we can only manage that in a way that we also show that we are ready to adapt a little bit to what they do. Al although we may not like it, but the world will not wait for us. And that, I think, is not only a challenge for for the next European Commission, but also for the member states, because I mean, all the tax systems, all the pension systems, they, they are still very national. They have very good ideas having <laughs> been, being introduced in the past, but they are not fit for the future. And that's a very burdensome discussion, and it's most difficult in countries where the older generation is much bigger than the younger one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, um, will also happen to France, maybe yeah. once. Um, and, and in a certain way, therefore, it's a real <coughs> societal challenge, um, and that is best to be shown with this sector. So if we can make more out of the debate, not only by, uh, by focusing on this, um, let's say, little details of the sector, but showing that digital is the global challenge also for the European Union, not only in economic terms, but also in societal terms, <laughs> would be good, mm. but will also demand a lot of changes that we have to, to do in the European Union. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, um, but uh, you know, some of the concerns from the startups has been that in Brussels, the focus has always been on regulation, leg legislation, and there hasn't been much thought on, on uh, you know, what you can do to foster innovation. And I mean, what do you think of this? Is this, does there need to be a, a, a title change or does one go hand in hand with the other? I mean, the debate that we have with the startups is very difficult because we are, l we are learning every day what is not possible and we try to uh, circumvent it. And startups are born in a, in a certain spirit of we do what, what is possible and we don't care about what is not possible. So the problem very often is that we have uh, is to spend a lot of time just to understand <laughs> that what we say is not stupid and what they say is not stupid either. Um, and therefore, I think that the challenge we are facing is that people in Europe have to understand that if we don't adapt to the globalization, uh, we will be uh, by force adapted to it. And the better we do it ourselves. And that is very burdensome because so far we still can live very well also by, fix, by kept keeping uh, fixed to the old system. And therefore, we, I can only encourage you not to give up and to show that you are faced to a global challenge that we will be faced all together at a certain moment in time. But I think if, you, if I think of that, I mean, what I would wish for the next administration or the next years to come, regardless of the administration, I guess, uh, is that we recognize the space as strategic, um, as a strategic asset for Europe, as something that's going to matter in terms of global dominance, actually, in the next 10, 20 years. And I think it was not the case 10 years ago. So but we cannot fix that by just discussing about taxing these companies differently. No, no, no I, I, I know. So, but, so we need regulations. We do need regulations. I think we need less naive regulations and more even like protectionism uh, around Europe in a smart way. Hmm. China is doing that, the US is doing that. I mean, it's much harder to get there than to get to, to Europe. Uh, in many ways, actually, it's a, it's, it is an open uh, field, actually, for every company to come. Uh, but it's much harder for European because you need to go through every European co country legislation to scale. So actually, by the time you, you get to a large scale, the US company is 10 times bigger. Um, so we need regulation, we need smarter regulation. I agree on stock options, I think we hammered that point. Um, so, so, so we, we probably need to, to change that in Europe. But maybe you know, to, to end on a positive note, I, I think two things, and 
we need to change shareholding. It was a very good point on shareholding. Actually, our companies are not European, if you look in detail. They're headquartered in Europe, but the shareholding mm -hmm. is not European, I, I bet, for the most part. Uh, most like unicorn in Europe, more than 50% of the capital is US or rest mm -hmm. of the world, not Europe. Let's think about that. The, the wealth is going elsewhere. Um, and on a positive note, if you look at two things, A, European are not selling their company as soon as they used to. So I think there is this ambition to build bigger companies and to go all the way. 10 years ago, I was in venture 10 years ago. 10 years ago, European company at your scale or my scale would have sold already. So, so now we're going all the way. Uh, and funding, I agree, if you get talent and if you get traction, I don't think it's as big of an issue as it was like 10 years ago. Hmm. So Optimism and courage, I think it's on this card. <laughs> That's what we need in the next That's <laughs> a really good way of ending it. Um, I think we are, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it on Johannes' last words there. So please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you.